I have the distinct pleasure of introducing this next speaker, uh, Ron Murray and his better half, Martha, who's sitting up in front, uh, are here from past instructors at Capital University, where I know John Roberts, myself, uh, Blanche Ruby, any other? Uh, Don. Yeah, Don. Of Don Ewan, of course. And I see another hand back there. Is that John? Yes. John's also a graduate. Uh, we all had Ron Murray as an instructor. He is uh, at the, can you pronounce this for me? It's the Asclepian Center, uh, named, named after Asclepius. Which is a uh, center for body, mind, therapy. He's a graduate of the University of Maryland as a physical therapist. This gentleman, I had thrown my back out and neck out, and he came in, and if you take a look at him, he doesn't look to be a very gentle type individual. He's kind of rough. In 1977, he was a regional champion in uh, weightlifting, and uh, he put his hands on me, and I had never felt such a gentle touch in my life. And at that point, changed my life tremendously, and many of the students at Capital University. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Ron Murray. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. You know, um, oftentimes my dental friends uh, tell me I must have been a dentist in another lifetime. Uh, they said the only problem is, is that I can't quite always remember the tooth numbers. But then I always had the fact that I could fall back on mercury toxicity, so uh, that's the way that goes. But uh, today I'll be presenting the colloid fluid model, the bridge between uh, biological and energetic medicine. Uh, this presentation is really the outgrowth of my close to 20 years of practice and my doctoral thesis um, at Capital University of Integrative Medicine. Uh, my intention today. Um, is to share with you the journey that brought me to uh, the bridge between the colloid fluid or the bridge between biological and energetic medicine, the colloid fluid model. The colloid fluid model is the synthesis of all the energetic, manual, and biological medicine that I have studied to date. And I hope that this work will unfold for you as it did for me as we move through the presentation. <coughs> the objective of, this, of the case study was to examine the immediate and accumulative influences of our model on the autonomic nervous system, and then to suggest an explanation for the changes in the autonomic nervous system in a patient that we treated in this study who uh, suffered from dystonia. Uh, the patient was treated bi-weekly for 12 weeks, and the autonomic nervous system was, um, was measured a pre and post treatment with a heart rate variability device, um, and the outcomes revealed a significant downregulation of the sympathetic nervous system and an upregulation of a weak parasympathetic system. And I don't know if you know the most recent literature of the last 10 years that strongly suggests uh, the uh, relationships between the uh, parasympathetic systems and the immune system. There's direct correlations between those two. Uh, so we'll be talking about uh, heart rate variability as we go through because that was, in this particular research, that was our, our major uh, mode of measurement. Wow. Martha, did you, did you put this picture in? <laughs> no, just, just joking. This is really where it all started for me. It feels like I'm gonna stick this all the way down my throat. No, this is where it all started for me. In the mid-1970s, I was a competitive Olympic-style weightlifter with aspirations of making the Olympic Games. And after winning the regional national champ or the regional championships, I developed a patellofemoral tracking problem in my, in my right knee. And um, like many of our patients, it took several years for me to find someone 
that could truly help me. So I started my search um, by uh, going after all the orthopedic surgeons that were related to the, to the professional sports teams in hopes that they would be able to help me. And collectively that group told me to either, collectively that group told me to either live with the pain or stop training. And for me, that wasn't an option. So I continued my search and ultimately found a guy by the name of Dr. David Brody, who ran the sports medicine clinic at George Washington University. And um, he did a video analysis of, my, of me running on the treadmill and found that my feet were pronated. So after he had some orthotics fabricated for me, we both thought the problem was over with. I was able to train for at least six months without absolutely any knee pain. However, once I started to increase my training load, it exacerbated the problem. And at that point, exploratory surgery was my only option. Now understand I could have walked away from this, unlike many of our patients, any time I wanted to. Because when I wasn't training, my knee wasn't hurting me. But again, this is what I wanted to do with my life. I was wild and crazy, early 20s. This was it for me. So we went ahead and did the exploratory surgery. Uh, it was successful, uh, but it did create a very persistent joint effusion. And at the same time, another Olympic year had gone by. And at this point, I had already committed six years of my life to this sport. So at this time, I decided uh, to go ahead and hang up the weightlifting shoes. So, what would I do with the rest of my life? Well, along the way I met a, a group of chiropractors and uh, physical therapists that were very compassionate and highly skilled. And I thought to myself, well, wow, if I could prevent one single individual from having to go through what I went through, I would be doing a really good thing with my life. So ultimately I decided on physical therapy school and once accepted, I thought that I would uh, go into sports medicine. With my passion for athletics and my interest in math and science, I thought that I would ultimately end up at Colorado Springs at the Olympic Training Center doing biomechanical analysis of sport. Well, an extraordinary, an extraordinary thing happened along the way. I met a fellow by the name of Joe Casino who uh, ran the orthopedics and manual therapy department at the University of Maryland at the Eastern Shore. And he had taken all the postgraduate, all the osteopathic postgraduate training at Michigan State University which at the time was the mecca of osteopathy in the entire country. And he brought these techniques back to the physical, physical therapy curriculum. And once introduced to them, I became enthralled. And as a senior in physical therapy school, he ran the sports medicine clinic. And I became the assistant athletic trainer of the school. And so all we did was osteopathy for my entire senior year. So once upon graduation, um, I found out later that it was unheard of for, any, for most people to get this type of training in physical therapy school. So for that I'm very grateful to Joe Casino because I got a foundation that even most osteopaths don't get in manual medicine. So this is the presentation outline. I'm going to get into uh, four healing modalities. Uh, I've been trained in, in many, many others, but these are four that have a strong influence into the colloid fluid model. The pioneers in the healing theory, um, their influences again in uh, drawing from this very broad group of people. Uh, the new tools to measure th the therapeutic mechanisms. We've been hearing a lot in our lectures about the autonomic nervous system and the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. And I believe this work is what influences those systems in a very powerful way. And I also believe that all the energetic therapies influence uh, the, the behavior of the human being 
through this autonomic nervous system, okay? Um, so we'll look at the, the heart rate variability, and I'll also just talk very briefly about dark field. Uh, the colloid fluid model, of course, um, how we came to that synthesis, and implications for practitioners. So is there anyone in the audience that hasn't, um, hasn't been introduced or heard of any of these four uh, therapeutic modalities? You have not? Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't want to go into each and every one of them into detail. So if there's something that you guys miss uh, that you haven't heard, if you don't get it by the end of the lecture, just come to me afterwards and I'll be more than uh, willing to discuss um, uh, how these modalities actually work. In cranial sacral therapy, there were two major events that took place for me that kind of moved me toward uh, the direction of this colloid fluid model. But before I get to those, in, this, in the approach that we were taught in, um, there's little room for what we would describe as a, uh, a psycho-emotional psycho process, and in, in what we would then be, and then what we would describe as a structure and functional world. And considering that it would be me, or it would be I, who would be responsible for um, educating the allopathic community to the value of craniosacral therapy. Uh, at least I thought that we would all speak the same language, so why muddy the waters with a body-mind connection? Well, however, uh, the, how the universe would have it, is I had a patient who was about 40 years old who came to my uh, facility with severe fibromyalgia. And she just happened to be a PhD psychotherapist researcher who was quite acquainted with the autonomic nervous system. So one particular day, I began treating her doing what we call a sphenobaser decompression. And just as, that, as if I were at a, meet, at, a, at a movie, frame by frame, this emotional catharsis began. First with her uh, telling me about her hands and palms getting um, sweaty, and then going to an image of her being kicked down a flight of stairs by her father at the age of six. So after processing this uh, with this person, I had to do a 180 in terms of my understanding of the psycho-emotional influences on somatic, on somatic dysfunction. And uh, particularly since in her next visit when she came back, approximately 80% of her presenting symptoms had resolved as a result of that session. <coughs> So that was a pretty powerful influence very early on in my career. So then the second case I'm going to talk to you about that leads more to the autonomic system was that I had a, a gentleman that came in with uh, ridiculous symptoms down the left shoulder and upper extremity. You know, he had discogenic problems. And um, I treated him, he came back after about six sessions and he uh, said, you know, Dr. Murray, my neck's a little better, but can you explain to me uh, how or why, after so many years of my blood pressure not being stable, that it's normalized as a result of your work? And you know, I'm sitting there scratching my head because I remember reading Magoon's book and getting my hands on every single piece of osteopathic literature that was available of all the anecdotal information that suggested that there were these very significant ties between the autonomic nervous system and cranial work. And so, I can't recall exactly what I told him, but I did tell him I was happy he was feeling better. So those are, so those are two very big things, big events at the time, that demonstrated to me uh, the influence of uh, the psycho-emotional and somatic dysfunction and the energetic and manual techniques and their influence 
on the autonomic <coughs> nervous system. So that kind of be, started to begin the, the trail for me or the journey for me to keep moving toward studying this autonomic nervous system. It became a very a big fascination of mine. So then as I continued my studies, um, I got involved in uh, fascia work, and this is my fascia release, but you know, fascia, our understanding of it is that it gives the human being uh, a level of support and, and protection of the internal structures. And um, it also has a, a much different behavior than muscles because with trauma, fascia will contract and twist and you can't pick any of that up on an x-ray, MRI, CAT scan, or any of the current diagnostic devices, but you can palpate it. But the more important thing about fascia, and I'll get to this later, is the extracellular matrix that is talked about extensively in Germany and is a big part of the colloid fluid model that I'll be describing as we move through the presentation. And then body-mind healing. Um, I would say 80% of the patients that come through our doors, irregardless of why they come, do some level of body-mind healing. And the quintessential case for me that really put this Holloway fluid model together for me was a 70-year-old female who presented to our clinic with severe cervical disc degeneration. And upon examination, she couldn't move her head or neck in any single direction. Prior to her examination with me, she had seen three neurosurgeons, all of which strongly suggested that she get a complete cervical spinal fusion because the fear was if she had a fall or an MVA, she could become a quadriplegic and even possibly die. Because of the severe, because of the severe instability in the neck. In fact, in fact, she saw one of the osteopaths that was renowned in our in our area, who said that, and this is a quote: "I went and touch you with a ten-foot pole." So I've got this poor little seventy-year-old lady looking me in the eyes, and I'm thinking for the first time, you know, maybe it's not such a good idea that I take this case on really sounds like quite a bit of liability. But she was in such distress and really said, I had nowhere else to go. So we began the work and I started indirectly, actually in the pelvis. And that's what we do oftentimes in very complicated cases. And around the sixth session, unbeknownst to the patient, a horrific sexual abuse issue arose. And as she processed this over uh, the, the next six sessions, her cervical mobility was almost normal and her muscle guarding in the neck uh, was almost completely gone. So I continued to treat this patient weekly for the rest of the year. And then she had another cervical MRI done. And the radiologist that had done the MRI had said that the progression of the disease had stopped. Now, again, I was a chief, I was a chief therapist for a group of major orthopedists for many, many years, and we did a lot of radiographs and MRIs and CAT scans. And that language was not in their vocabulary. So I had to be curious. You know, I'm a very curious person. Let's see what's going on. What's the mechanism of, that, of action here? So we felt that once we unloaded the psycho-emotional burden on this patient, that it then allowed for the natural regulatory processes to, to kind of jumpstart again, to, to start working again. And so then you get the laying down of new cartilage and bone and soft tissue and so forth. So that that's really the major case that kind of put it all together for us, and we all know in biological medicine, you know, what is the foundation of biological medicine? Okay, well, one, one part of that foundation is based on the fact that all organ systems in the body have a regenerative rate, right? 
So what are you doing? What are you guys doing practicing? One thing you're doing is that you're eliminating stressors. If I can eliminate the stressor, that's part one, right? Mercury amalgam, amalgam fillings, heavy metals, all the other burdens that we know. If we can eliminate those burdens, that's number one. Number two, then we have to support the regeneration of the organ system. Okay? And so those are kind of the foundational things to healing. Any questions or comments to, to this point? I hope this isn't too far of a stretch in dentistry. All right, the next area, visceral manipulation. Well, this, this was a, an incredible gift to me to be able to take this work. Two thirds of the body are, are visceral. They all have their inherent motion to it. And um, if in fact you had sciatica, you were in France or one of the European countries, if you had sciatica down the right leg, it would be considered a liver kidney problem. If you had sciatica down the left leg, it would be considered sigmoid fulvin. Okay? So that's how much differently some people look at um, issues that we would typically look at in the spine. Okay? But this is really big because it just has all kinds of influences on the somatic system as well as as well as the visceral pathologies and we can palpate these things, and that's what we do. In addition, another wonderful assessment device for this is the contact regulation thermography. <laughs> so at our clinic, being able to measure the regulatory capacity of the individual is prominent. That's what we do. That's what we do best. And then finally, this would be kind of the gross uh, illustration of this colloid fluid model I'm talking about. Because what does it include? It includes everything. Why does it include everything? Because from a physics perspective, everything in the body behaves colloidally. Okay? Everything is constantly being broken down and it's constant being laid down. So it's a very dynamic process. <coughs> And it includes all the organs, uh, all the energetic fields, all the protoplasma that behaves as, coll as a colloid. Um, there's, a, there's not a tissue in this model that's not represented. Or there's not a tissue in the human body that's not represented because of its behavior. And all that behavior, all that motility, all the movement, is regulated by what? The ANS. The ANS. The autonomic nervous system. And what I'm going to show you in a few minutes is that it's the same behavior, it's the same thing on a cellular level. Okay? So ultimately I hope that what you get out of this lecture is that the ANS controls it all. It's the thread between the micro and the macro world, okay? So it's really helpful for me because when I put that patient on the table and I do my body scan, I'm just attracted to what doesn't move. And then I know what, and then because of all the palpation uh, skills I've had and training I've had, I can determine what structure it is that doesn't move. And that tells me there's a rigidity there. And if there's a rigidity there, what's happened? Well, there's something's happened to that sympathetic nervous system. So, over my almost two decades of practice, I've witnessed many such unexpected therapeutic changes. I start working on one body system or level, and healing comes about in another. But this experience challenges a basic medical paradigm that the human organism is composed of systems to be viewed and treated independently of one another. Okay? And that's basically what's wrong with medicine in a lot of ways. Yeah. So 
here are some of the pioneers I'm going to discuss, um, and I'll do this individually. Each one of these individuals had a significant influence on my understanding and synthesizing this model. So uh, Carl Holland, he's an American contemporary, he taught that structure in the body is an abstraction and that the body is dynamic, not static. And 90% of the molecules are replaced every six, to six months. So that other 10% equates to the musculoskeletal system that sometimes takes between five and seven years to, uh, to uh, be replaced. And then all living protoplasma behaves as a cobbler. And I don't know if I mentioned, he was a physicist before he became a DO. And as I was coming up developing this model, it was very helpful um, listening to his information because he really helped me with the nomenclature to be able to explain what I was doing to a lot of other people, for a lot of other people, and to be able to put the model together in a, in a greater way to describe it for others. Okay. And he talks about a colloid uh, and that it may behave as a liquid or a solid. And I kind of like the example of putting uh, starch in a bowl of water. And if you, put a st if you put starch in a bowl of water and you run a spatula through it and you do that nice and slowly, the behavior is of a liquid. And then when you accelerate that spatula, the molecules just compress and it behaves more like a solid. Okay. So in our body, bone would be a solid, more solid form of this colloid structure that he's talking about. But understand, as we're all sitting here, our bone is being broken down and relayed down constantly, all the time. And if I could take my femur out right now, lie, I could probably bend it at least 20 or 30 degrees, okay? So we kind of talked about the, the gross aspects of this colloid fluid model. And now we're going to go into uh, more of the cellular, cellular aspects of that. So I'm sure most of you are acquainted that biological medicine is a branch of medicine that focuses on connecting and restoring the internal milieu and cellular regulation. And Gunther Indolin, of course, was a pioneer. And he discovered the endobiont, which were proteins or minute proteins and or minute colloids. Or colloids. And he believed that the protein, not the cell, was the smallest living unit, and found that these proteins would upgrade and downgrade dependent upon the internal environment and the alkaline acid balance. Okay? That's what would create these shifts. So we've got all these patterns going on. You've got these cranial sacral systems. You've got the visceral system. You've got the fascial system. You've got all these different systems and all this motion going on. And here, even on the microscopic level, you've got all these changes constantly going on depending upon the stressors to the system, whether it be a malignant stress or whether it be poor dietary habits. These guys are going to upgrade and downgrade constantly. So this is the bacterial psychogeny, um, as um, illustrated by the Paracelsus Clinic of Dr. Enderlin's work. And just the important point here is that this is where the pro tip would be in the beginning of this cycle. And as the uh, acid base changes, these forms upgrade, and they ultimately will upgrade into bacterial forms. If there are antibiotics involved, they will actually degrade some of the cell walls, so they create what they call cell wall deficient form or L form of that bacteria, okay? And there's not a thing about antibiotic can do for that L form bacteria, except make more of them. And then, uh, also, uh, the regulation can get blocked due to heavy metals and, and, uh, and other things along this journey. So ultimately, the pro, pro tit, or the apathogenic form of the endobiont, ultimately becomes a fungal form. And it's these fungal forms that will ultimately bring us back down to Earth 
once we die. So these are the forms that actually break us back down. The thing is, is in our culture and lifestyle, they are facilitated much too fast, and then they lead to degenerative diseases, okay? like a universe of its own, doesn't it? This is a, a, a dark field slide. And um, this was a patient that I had initially treated for seasonal allergies many, many years ago. And he was in France and developed food poisoning. And I took this slide three days after. So, um, you see a number of things from this slide. One is that you see some pretty unhealthy red blood cells and some bacterial forms. But the point I brought the slide in for was that you get a symprotid that ultimately upgrades to uh, these higher valence forms. The sinusid, that's what this is called here in, in Inderland's world, and this is an upgraded form, okay? And um, I've been told by some of the American Indians that this form up here is called the dog form, and it's there to protect the entire environment uh, there. So we're, that's still under investigation. I'm glad some people have a sense of humor. <laughs> but isn't, isn't this fascinating, you know? When I first took this guy's blood, my jaw almost dropped, but I couldn't do that in front of me. So I just kept, I just kept taking the slide over and over again, thinking that it, it had to be some aberration, because that was the first time I'd ever seen so many bacterial forms in my life. What else does this tell you about this person? Can anybody just guess? What does it say about the integrity of this small intestine? It doesn't exist. There you go. There you go. And definitely a permeability problem here. Even though the blood is not sterile, you should never have that many microbes floating around. So. So Alfred Pissinger is the next, uh, the next pioneer. And he theorized that the extracellular fluid uh, were the key to health. And he named these fluids the matrix of the ground regulation system supporting everything else, and that the fluids bring nutrients, oxygen, hormone messengers, and while removing toxins and uh, excretory products and so forth. And then there was Reckenweg, who um, developed the theory of homotox homotoxicology, and he, and he focused on um, the role of toxins in the cellular matrix and extracellular fluids, theorizing that these toxins negatively, negatively influence the regulatory system of the cellular matrix, reducing their capacity for excretion, inflammation, and elimination. Whoops. And that's all regulation right there. That's basic regulation, excretion, inflammation, and elimination. And then he theorized that toxins could be either exogenous, originating outside the body, or endogenous, and originating within the body. And Breckenwick's approach to healing theorizes that the disease does not begin in the individual cell, but with changes to the regulatory systems of the cellular matrix. And of course, working through the principles of homeopathy, Breckenwick designed ways to clear and revitalize the extracellular fluids, which in turn revitalize the cells. This is uh, Hartmann Hein, and he's actually a German scientist, and he was actually a prodigy of Pissinger's. And uh, this, is, this is probably, this slide is probably one of the most important that you'll see today, okay? Um, Hein discussing the fact that the autonomic nerve fibers come to a blind end in the intracellular matrix, and directly connecting the matrix to the central nervous system 
That's the physiological and anatomical proof to a body-mind connection. Right there. Don't read that in Guyton. I've not seen it in Guyton's book. It's right there, though. Uh, that the capillaries are linked to the matrix, to the endocrine glands, and the brainstem. Particularly the hypothalamus and the endocrine glands connect through the matrix. And again, as I said, the matrix regulating system is constantly regulated by psychological and mental factors, not just physical ones. So that's pretty big. I mean, that opens up the whole world between your thought processes and what happens in your body. Or even bit better yet, your belief systems and what happens to your body. Okay? I mean, very, very important work here. And again, putting the body-mind stuff together. And the, and the dental, dental stuff is not excluded from any of that. It's all part of this model. Uh, question? Yes. The lymph fibers also go into the extracellular matrix. So you're saying in effect, or he's saying in effect, that the lymph system as well is closely associated with these other fibers? Absolutely. I'm going to show you that in just the next frame here. One step ahead of me. Yeah, very good, uh, very good question. So there you have it. <laughs> Come say, did, did. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the extracellular matrix. Um, this is from Pissinger's book. And again, the critical parts to this, the sympathetic nervous system innervating and parasympathetic nervous system innervating and the viscosensitive nerves innervation the extracellular fluid, here's your lymph glands here, and then your target organ, and then your capillary beds all within this uh, extracellular matrix system. So here's the important part of this. Everything has to interface through this. Mercury has to go through this before it can get to an organ system. I mean, this is the place where it all happens, and I've loved the lecture so far today and, and on Saturday, but not only is there a biochemical system that works here, there's an energetic system that works here. So anything that you do energetically has to influence this matrix in order to affect the change. Again, acupuncture. Where do you think those needles are going? Right into that extracellular matrix. That's how they're affecting the change on the, on the chi that runs through this. I just got finished with the Jeffrey Bland class. And you know what he was talking about? The epigene and what was happening at the extracellular matrix with the epigene. I mean, that is the information center to our world. It's a cellular matrix. All regulated by the autonomic nervous system. So, let me take a break. Do you guys think I could go any faster that's not conducive for a human being? But then the, it's a risk reward issue, and then how much is that going to influence uh, a particular problem? You know? It's like uh, there, the controversy about there are many people like, that, are, that want to keep rooting teeth. Right? And they're doing everything from ozone to checking various forms of bacteria out to make sure that they don't have these certain toxic ones that say get rid of it. But ultimately, you know, it's, it's, you're, it's like you're playing with fire with that, you know? So it's a tough call, really risk reward. But essentially, anything that's not human, you know, shouldn't be in the body. But I mean, you want to get closer and closer to materials that are more um, user-friendly. You know, Brian, yeah. keep on going with your lecture. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so therefore, the colloidal behavior, the inherent energy and motility of the extracellular matrix and the living cells is governed by the ANS. Uh, Dr. John Upledger, who I've studied with on several occasions, uh, uh, contemporary scientists developed cranial sacral therapy. Upledger's theory of healing involves verbal and nonverbal dialogue or talking to the cells. 
that was a great deal of what I did with the woman that I explained uh, in her 70s who had this uh, severe um, degenerative disc disease. Um, and um, he added, he talked about his energy cyst theory, which is really important because human beings are open systems. And there's always a build up uh, of energy and then a reduction of it. And it's happening all the time and we really don't live through the second law of thermodynamics that really occurs in a vacuum. So anytime this entropy builds up enough and stays there enough, like if you're looking at a bell curve and it's two or three standard deviations away on one side or the other, it's ultimately going to lead to some dysfunction and or disease. So John was talking about the energy cyst mostly in terms of some type of traumatic event. And oftentimes now you have potential and kinetic energy coming into the body and essentially getting lodged there. So this energy doesn't really belong to you. So in doing our work, we help to try to resolve or eliminate that energy. And then once we do that, the regulatory capacities of the body come back. And we've seen that time and time. We've seen that time and time again through our work. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, a cellular biologist, yeah. familiar with his work. Absolutely. Would you care to comment on the effect of negative and positive uh, mind states on the cell membrane? Well, uh, let's get back to that once I finish the lecture, because I've got a lot to go through. Okay, but it's a very good question, and I love Bruce's work. <coughs> Uh, so if you wanted to talk about, you know, bring it, again, the two worlds together, biological medicine and, and some of the body-mind stuff, um, what we would do is we would begin our intention when we would work with people to normalize the autonomic nervous system, okay? The other thing we could do is dialogue, and I'm actually talking about dialoguing with these, uh, the, with the endobiont, okay? If we know that someone has a progressive disease somewhere in their body, we could essentially dialogue with the apathogenic form of the endobion in the body to, to perhaps migrate to a place where it would be much more useful in downgrading these higher forms, okay? So this technology um, may be new to you, but this is what we've been doing for many, many years. And then finally, everybody knows the value of the Pyers patches, and these guys get insulted from birth almost, you know? from zero to one, the first time an individual ingests uh, cow's milk or chicken egg, that becomes inflamed. Someone earlier talked about T, about T cell information, and so once you've got the, this inflammatory response or this antigen antibody reaction, guess what? You got it for life. I don't care what form you take it in. So, so you could dialogue with these Pyers patches. You could, one, find out what the allergen is, and to find out what its needs are and try to help to restore the integrity of these things, which would then secondarily boost the immune system. So no, this is kind of out of your realm, but anyone that does body-mind work uh, could easily bring this into the picture of now understanding the biological implications of, of uh, what happens in the body. And then uh, James Oshman uh, is a physicist and he published extensively on the scientific basis of energy medicine and found that the hand of practitioners pulses at a variable frequency of 0.3 to 30 hertz with most activity in the 7 to 8 hertz range and states that this range is within the spectrum to affect biological processes. So the moment I put my hands on someone inter and interface with them, we're already moving uh, the energy and creating uh, changes in the system. So to review, the ANS and healing, uh, energetic and non-force manual therapy creates a change in the rigidity of the cellular matrix on a local and systemic level through normalizing the ANS. And the, of course the ANS regulates the involuntary action and includes the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. The tools that we use to measure um, these changes in regulation one is heart rate variability, and the other one is medical microscopy. Uh, the heart rate variabil variability is um, broken down into the nerve express and health express, and uh, me it measures current functioning of the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems and indicates patient's functional adaptation reserve for healing. You can see he's got the strap 
and the receiver there on his chest. <coughs> and so we look at the method, method of rhythmography, and this is a visual representation of the heart rhythm, and the straight line represents the time intervals between the beats, so we're measuring these uh, beat-to-beat responses here. And then the rhythmiogram is a wave portrait. And uh, this wave portrait is composed of these 488 R to R, R values. And at this point, here you see uh, the patient would be supine. And then this would be the transition phase of when the patient stands. And then this would be the reporting of the variability uh, in standing. The important piece here is that the low frequencies represent the sympathetic nervous system here, and the higher frequencies represent the parasympathetic system. This is uh, Alexander Rifton's interpretation of the HRV, and essentially we want to be in these green regions. The patients that present to our clinics that are in these green regions are the easiest, they are the easiest problems to resolve typically. Okay. Uh, absolute normal here is in the center, and relative normal is within this red box. Most of the patients that, that we see, and everyone that we see, has an initial HRV, HRV to get a baseline as to what's happening with them. And then you can see the various, in, uh, in the uh, upper left corner, in this area you see acute distress, here you see temporary or chronic problems uh, that can be exhaustion, intoxication, infection, and nervous tension. Here you see a significant reduction in parasympathetic tone and, and not much going on sympathetically. Uh, this would be the area of old age. Actually this quadrant, when you look at the Paracelsus interpretation, has a lot to do with viral and other types of toxicity. And then this area is old age and um, some degeneration and cancers that are thought to be found in this area. And so it's a, it's a really wonderful device to be able to get a baseline as to the health of the person's autonomic nervous system and then to implement therapies. And for us, every eight to 12 sessions, we do another one, another test to see if the patients are moving in the right direction, irregardless of how they're feeling, because sometimes the patient will be feeling great, but this hasn't moved, and so we want to make sure that we get this as close to normal as we possibly can, so that we may need to initiate uh, other forms of therapy, or if in fact um, they came in and they, they knew that we did uh, a lot of cranial work, or we wanted a particular modality and we talked to them about their mouth and fillings or their rooted teeth. By the time we take them through a series of treatment, now they're ready to listen to, okay, I need you to see this dental person or that person to have that checked out if in fact these things aren't moving. And then the Health Express part of this, um, it defines a functional state based on a mathematical analysis of the, the wave structure of the HRV and creates a wave portrait reflecting the level of functioning of the physiological systems of the level of adaptive reserve. And again, up here is a professional athlete, and you can see very strong variability. Uh, this chronotrophic uh, response uh, represents this area in the transition field, and this vascular compensation uh, represents the area going up here. And you can see on the graph, he ends up in this left upper corner where you would expect a professional or an Olympic athlete to be. And then you see the heart disease patient, and they're down here in the lower left quadrant. But just looking at there's very little variability going on here, and, and very little transition phase. So here's just another example of the uh, heart rate variability analysis. Uh, this individual's right kind of in the middle. This is uh, a pretty good place to be. If you look over here at the uh, rhythmogram, 
You can see his chronotropic reaction is good, but his vascular compensation isn't so good. So this is actually a nerve express that we did. Uh, actually, I did this with a friend of mine. And, uh, and uh, she had had a history of insomnia, uh, Lyme's disease, and she had recently had some skin cancer. And I had, a few, I had a few minutes to work with her, so we did a 45 minute treatment. And you can see initially before the treatment, she was at negative three five. Now again, at negative three five, is this a place you might want to remove amalgams? You have to consider that, or have to consider at least how many quadrants you plan on removing because understand that this ties directly into the patient's immune system. And you don't want to overwhelm these people by taking out or reintroducing mercury too quickly. Okay? Uh, but nevertheless, for, for this point is that she was at negative 3.5. We worked on her for 45 minutes and she went through from negative 3.5 to negative 2. And had she gone to the negative 1, that would be within that red box that I showed you earlier, which would have simply been a relative normal. And those were the outcomes in our, in our study that we saw, that we would improve that. Now I just want to talk a little bit about my next piece of research based off this. There's been a group of, um, of pharmacologists, I hate to say, but you gotta get the information from someone, where they were using electrical stimulators and they were actually stimulating the vagal nerve at the base of the skull. And guess what they found? Well, they found that they were down-regulating both inflammatory markers and cytokines in a very big way. And they started noxiously stimulating animals and then stimulating this and knocking that out too. So I'm following with my work the same mechanism of action. And you know, currently I'm down at George Washington University. I teach the first and second year medical school students there. And I may have an opportunity to do some research there. So the next piece of research I would do is I would run these people all through the HRV again. But in addition to that, we would do blood draws and then we would measure those cytokines. And if in fact we could show that we are also getting that down regulation of inflammatory markers and cytokines, that would be a pretty big finding for complementary medicine and particularly for this uh, hands-on medicine that we do. So finally, um, medical microscopy, I use a, um, I use this particular microscope. Um, it's a little different than uh, most. Uh, these optics are all the same, but it has this projection piece up here that then allows about 15,000 magnification. And again, what we're trying to do with the microscope is again, it's another way to understand the regulatory capacities on a, on a microscopic level. We can look at the integrity of the red blood cell, the integrity of the white blood cell, the integrity of the plasma, and for those that, of you that understand Enderman's work, we can look at the endobionic load. Based off all those things, and all the other information that we have, we can then create a protocol or program for them to um, make them healthier. And then we're always using these um, functional assessment devices to then recheck after about eight to 12 weeks. So this is William Blake's portrait, and I thought that this really represents our colloid fluid model. The colloid fluid model is a way to understand the integrated functions of the human mind, body, body, mind, and spirit, and the mechanisms of healing. The colloid fluid model, a theoretical breakthrough. A colloid is a substance or structure that sometimes behaves like a liquid and a solid, uh, the body behaves as a colloid fluid structure on every level, micro, macro, but once systemic. And I tried to illustrate those in some of the examples that I gave earlier as how I was treating one symptom or one system and something 
altogether unexpected occurred. And the model sees the body as being in a constant flux moving between these viscoelastic and viscoplastic properties. The colloid fluid model and stress, any trauma or stress that triggers the ANS, uh, in turn affects the autonomic tone of all the body tissue. And when the tissue behaves with more rigidity, they retain imprints of trauma and stress and perpetuating inflammation, pain, and dysfunction. So our conclusions are that healing modalities, and I mean all healing modalities, from acupuncture to reiki, to everything's included in this colloid fluid model. That's the beauty of it. it. Does not exclude one single modality. Why? Because whether they know it or not, every one of these modalities is influencing this ANS in some way. That's why. So in addition, like touch manual therapy positively influences the function of the ANS and the state of the extracellular fluids that control the ANS, not the individual cell. That's the key to health. Um, this is uh, Dr. Edward Fries. He was a Lasker Award winner in 1971. He uh, was responsible for the VA studies on hy in hypertension. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize twice. He was my sounding board for many, many years uh, as I was uh, developing and putting this model together. He also happened to be the father of my uh, partner over here, Martha Bromhall. And uh, he also went through a course of treatment with me and gave me the loving and affectionate name of Fingers Murray. <laughs> and finally, uh, this is the Asclepian Center. We have a manor house that's been built out on two acres of land in Silver Spring right outside the Beltway. And, um, uh, you know, again, we do a, a whole lot of different things there, uh, from psychotherapy to the work we discussed. Uh, we have all these functional assessment devices that are there, as well as I've got the uh, medical microscopy down at GW, where I do dark field. And um, if you're interested in coming by, there's the contact information. I'd love to have you. Thanks. We do have time for a few questions. Alex, come on up. What can you tell us about, what can you tell us about the sphenopeditine ganglion uh, connection to the parasympathetic slash cranial work? Yeah, I, I believe that we can uh, intimately affect that uh, both through a general manipulation of the cranium, but also through the intraoral areas of the cranium and actually even going back into the soft palate at, at times uh, to influence that. So, so that's very, very big. It's quite rare to find uh, any anatomy books that show us that relation or that pictures and so forth. Anyone should recommend that we go first? Well, no, but, uh, but you know, sometimes those things occur both indirectly too because they're all, they're all invaginated by the, um, by the, the dura mater and so forth. So, you know, the way cranial work is designed is to affect a particular uh, membrane, whether, say, it's horizontal or vertical, right? But they're all really one of the same membranes. So if you're if you're putting pressure on one, you're going to influence a lot of other structures. But if you can specifically get close to that ganglion through the, the mechanism of manipulation, you're going to be able to restore the integrity of it, or at least downregulate it or influence it in some way, even if it's some um, uh, uh, s uh, small circulatory uh, changes in that area. Okay. Oh, neurotherapy stuff. Oh, neurotherapy is, is, is big. It's very big. I'm, you know, I wish I had more time because I would talk about the relationships between neurotherapy and that ganglion and other things because it's very, very powerful. Yeah. Thanks, Lev. Would you show us a couple of little moves on visceral therapy? What would you do? Is there a clockwise thing? Is there a general principle? Is there some overriding uh, anatomical thing you're trying to achieve? Sure. Kind of what's the basic? I, I'd love to. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're gonna grab the table and I'll give you guys an example. How's that? Thanks a lot. So one, um, I just don't treat viscerally anymore. Uh, you know, it, it just it never worked. But just to give you an example of what it is, I looked at him as a colloid fluid model. Okay, he will. I may not even know who he is, but he presents with essentially everything that's ever happened to him. Why is that? The reason that is is that we adapt and compensate really well to traumas, whether they be physical, psycho-emotional, metabolic, or whatever, you, you name the trauma. We accommodate and adapt to them, but we don't integrate uh, well uh, from these traumas, and I'm not sure why, okay? It's the nature of the beast, the way God designed us. But anyway, then, then how, do, how do I figure this out? So I put my hands on him, and essentially I'm attracted to what doesn't move. Okay, so I can forget about the different systems. This is cranial, is this visceral, whatever. And I can just be concerned about what doesn't move for him. And right now I'm attracted to his liver. Okay? So maybe he had a couple of drinks last night. Who knows? It wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and then it actually even goes up, there's a pool even up, up into the lungs, so liver and lung on the right side, okay? And he's still thinking, he, what? Yeah, he can put three synapses together. No, right. Actually, three is the, the smallest. Uh... Okay, so he's got something happening in the knee. Okay, so I don't really, if I, I don't really need a patient's history, with the exception is I want to make sure I don't do anything that might be contraindicated, but the, the type of touch that I use seldom is. But that's my only purpose, and it's nice to listen to people because they really want to be validated and they really want to be heard. So through that reason alone, I'm constantly being present for a patient in how they describe their history. But where I get my information is right here. Why? Because this doesn't lie, and nobody knows their shit as well as they think they do. <laughs> Period. They just don't. So you don't. You, you would be shocked how many practitioners that are highly skilled in the Washington metropolitan area that come in and tell me da 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 da, da and we get started, and boom, they're off to the races, and they go, I thought I already did that work. You know, they, they haven't because it's, it's just still there. So. What I'm feeling here, this is where I would start with Mike. I would start with his liver here, okay? Uh, would you like to, see, like to see a little bit of work here? Yes. Okay. There's not a lot to observe, uh, but I can tell you what I'm doing is I'm just kind of 
interfacing with them and I'm following the inherent movement of this organ and then ultimately I'll follow what he's working around. And then I'll collectively stack these kind of restrictions and then I'll hold it there and between the fluids and the energy, that's really where the release will come. And then he will direct me to somewhere else. And that's how it works. So you don't see any high velocity thrust here. Okay, because, yeah, what's that? Move around. Move around. Move around. No, it's Don's head. I need Don's head out of the way. That's Okay, I'm sorry. Th thank you so much. So, again, if I were to go in this, if I were to go into this area, and this is a beautiful thing. You know, I, I told you, I've been working with dentists all my life. The, the big guy in my life right now, the dental is Dr. Sam Patero, if you, any of you guys know him. The great thing about him is he's out all the cranial work. So when he goes into someone's mouth, he does it with a cranial intention. So people like to come to him, you know? I mean, I love dentists, but, but how many people really want to come to a dentist, you know? So, um, anyway, maybe, maybe I've said too much. <laughs> yeah. Is it liver uh, also fear? Uh, it, it can it can be an emotional Why, thing. Kidneys, Yeah. It's it's certainly yeah. No, you're absolutely. It can be fear, but yeah. Who said kidneys are fear? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Generally, uh, although I don't hold to these rules because I've seen so many emotional things come out of bones, right? So. Um, but he's working on something here. He's always working on something. Right. Take more room yeah. for me tonight. <laughs> but so the idea in, in treating Mike would be I would find these various areas of treat, treatment or areas of restriction in this fluid model, right? I mean, someone might say, well, his pelvis is twisted or he's got a right side bending and all that business. and. Those things typically are secondary to a lot of other things that are going on. So what I do is I go, okay, hey, what doesn't move? What seems to be primary? I can use what they teach you early on in visceral, which is called inhibition and touch a place and figure out what's primary from that. But I've been doing this so long, I don't really need to do that any longer. So, uh, so let's say I do a thousand manipulations with Mike today, right? Many, many micro manipulations, if you want to call them that, for lack of a better word. He goes on, what I've done is I've facilitated a process. And he goes on the rest of the week, and he is going through this self correcting mechanism that week. And then I'll bring him in again, and I'll reevaluate, and again, treat what doesn't move. Where's that rigidity? And, I know, and then I know ultimately that that will move him back within his physiological adaptive range. So if we look at a bell curve, and Mike's two or three standard deviations away from the midline, the goal of our treatment would to be slowly to move him back toward the midline at his rate and time, not at someone else's. Not at someone else's. That's determining that through this. Again, and I have no problems, no real problems with muscle testing. But this is his process. It's not mine. And there are thousands of signatures that come up that I pick up with people all the time. And, and then I have to... Uh, think about it, are they there to do that work with me? So say this is not Mike, this is a woman who's been abused in some way. I put my hand here and boom, I get this signature of that type of abuse. I can't automatically presume that because I've picked up all these various things with this person, that they're there to do them with me. So what I do is I'll ultimately bring their awareness to that area and I'll see if they want to work, that, work through that. And if they do, those images or feelings will come up and then we're off to the races. Then anything is gained. Anything. Okay? Any questions or comments around this yet? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, us as dentists, uh, our biggest contribution for your colloidal fluid system yes. that we influence big time is vertical dimension. Well, yeah, vertical absolutely. dimension and the yeah. swallow mechanism are extremely important. You can treat a you know, person cranially for many hours. 
he stands up and he swallows, he's got lack of vertical dimension, everything is canceled out. The vertical dimension is primary. Uh, over the years when we did orthodontics, usually dentists constantly lose vertical dimension. And uh, of course, uh, 20 years ago, I was attacked by opening up vertical dimension. Vertical dimension opening also is related on the cranial classification, class one, class two, right. class three. Yeah. So it's very, very important for dentists to understand vertical dimension and the swallow mechanism yeah. because that really does influence the colloidal system. Right. No, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, uh, dentistry, <clears throat> and maybe I didn't make the point strong enough, and <clears throat> I think one of the reasons that Mike invited me is that, again, I've been associated with dentists all my life and uh, doing TMJ work and understanding those mechanisms. Uh, working with Jim Jackman, who used to, uh, who initially worked with uh, Crozads and Curanon appliances to actually shift the uh, maxilla and change the cranial orientation of that. And um, we initiated that study, we never completed it, but we were doing it with biofeedback and seeing ultimately where someone began with these changes and using a force plate to find out how their entire body mechanics would alter as a result of using that. So your point's well taken. And uh, we work with people, I work with dental people all the time, from um, Mark McClure, who's a biological dentist, to Dr. San Matero, to Louis Lowe Weiner, who's a swallowing expert. So your, uh, your uh, comment is well received, thank you. So I can, one last question. I guess the question is that, because I work with a lot of, yeah. I guess the question is, when I work with cranial practitioners as well, and it's knowing when you start to increase the vertical or you accept, because vertical may wear down through age, the body compensates for it, which is great until they have an illness or an injury, and then they can never recover because they need that vertical put back again. That would be my take on it. And it's educating the cranial practitioners say, if you go and do dentistry, you change the whole of the system, whereas that, you know, otherwise they just adapt and compensate down. And that's, I think, what we're, we're both talking about. So how do you determine when you send them to a dentist to increase the vertical to get changes that you can't otherwise get? Is that well put? Yes. Yeah, that's a difficult question, but I would answer it through <coughs> by doing a significant amount of mouth work and not getting the responses that I felt that we needed to resolve the problem. That, that would really be it. So then I would ask for some additional support there. Yeah. I would just answer by saying that we need to remember the mandible doesn't move just up and down, but it moves up and down, back and forth, side to side, pitches, rows, does all the other six posi positions. There is a technique and there's a technology out there to do that using ultra low frequency tens, using EMGs, using a kinesiology or kinesiograph to measure where the mandible is. And it can be very easily, in, well not easy, but it can be arrived at for patients where you know, have a background. And then from that, put them in some type of orthotic, which by the way, does also reposition the AO joint that stabilizes the cranial base, which then you can build a conclusion do implants or whatever else you want to do, you're going to have a stable base and you're going to have a stable bite over time rather than guessing. I know because I used to guess. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with your question and your question and your question, <coughs> one of the most significant aspects to it, both from an upper ledger point of view and Sutherland, who was really the, the original thinker of this work, at least in our day, uh, is that have you cleared all the musculoskeletal, all the visceral, all the other structures first, and then if in fact you've done that and you've done your mouth work in an appropriate fashion, then it's time to go ahead and, yeah. See, the swallow mechanism is the end point. It's, to, for me, I've done right. a lot of cranial work, it's more important than the cranial work, mm -hmm. because every, you have to swallow so many times a day. If you don't have vertical dimension, you protect yourself either sucking your cheeks in, you're putting your, your, your tongue between your teeth. So it's imperative, it has to start with the dentist. It's right. <clears throat> well, well, at this point, no. well, on, one le on one level, we'll have to agree to disagree because we've seen some of those things reverse as a result of the intraoral work that we were doing. So I'm not saying that 
your role and your thinking model and all that's wrong. I'm just saying that I've seen it work the other way. So I'm, that, I'm gonna have to stop there with it. Yeah. I wanna thank Ron for being here today. And uh, I know he was under the weather for the past few days and it's good to see him back on his feet. Thank you. We, um, the board,